cold shoulder. They lay in bed, side by side, the dark pressing in around them. And despite the ice frosting the windows and the howling wind, they each kept to their side of the bed. Windy heard the furnace kick on again somewhere in the bowels of the house. A floorboard creaked. The wind screeched, pressing against the house until the siding moaned. The shed door slammed open and shut, caught in the torrent. With a huff and a tug of the cover, she rolled over onto her side, toward the end table with its thin coat of dust glowing in the moonlight. 12.42, the alarm clock accused. She should have been asleep three hours ago, but all she could do was think about the dishwasher. Her mistake had been to assign the ceremony of after-dinner dish-loading to her husband, Barry. She thought she'd removed all possible obstacles for him. She added the powder herself. She'd set the dishwasher to the proper cycle. He just needed to put the dishes in and press one little button. How hard was that? Yet the next thing she knew, she was standing in an inch of soapy hot water. Her house slippers soaked right through. This was the final straw for her. I'm tired, I don't feel well, and the last thing I want to do is come home and spend the night listening to your stupid excuses. You said you'd reseal the dishwasher months ago. I'm sorry, Barry said for the hundredth time, running a hand through his hair. You're always sorry, Barry, she snapped back. And you'll keep being sorry because the only way that dishwasher is getting fixed is if I hire someone to come fix it. Because I'll have to be the one to handle it. I'm always the one. He reached out for her. I'll fix it, I promise and let his hand fall. But his reassurances had not placated her, and now her unchecked fury was keeping her awake. The clock flashed 1.22, and she had to get up for work in just five hours. Five hours. The shed door slammed again. I suppose I'm just gonna have to lay here listening to that door slam all night, she murmured. I'll shut it, Barry said. He threw back his side of the covers, grabbed his gray house robe off the hook on the back of the bedroom door, and stepped out into the unlit hall. Wendy listened to the stairs creak under his weight, to the storm door open and shut behind him. Well, he should be the one to shut the shed door. He was the one who went in there. It was because he had been negligent with the latch to begin with. Even so, he had gotten up. And it must be ten degrees out there, she thought sitting up in bed. White flurries of snowfall trickled past the window, bright in the moonlight they'd collected, and the wind kept howling. The door slammed once more, and she even thought she heard one of Barry's little grunts. No doubt it required a bit of effort to force the door closed in this persistent wind. I'll kiss him when he gets back, she thought. I'll thank him for going out in the cold just to close the door for me. And if he managed to get around to resealing the dishwasher this weekend... Maybe she would do more than kiss him. Wendy lay back down and waited for her husband to return. 1.30, 1.36, 1.41. The clock marched on. What's taking so long? She wondered, dozing. But without her anger and the slamming door to keep her awake, she fell asleep. She woke to the bed sinking beneath her. Barry, she thought. It was just the mattress caving to her husband's weight. But the cold breeze of the night must have followed him into the house, because an icy chill surrounded him. Oh, you're freezing, she said, clutching the covers to her body. He seemed to hesitate and pull back from her. I'm sorry, he whispered, his voice paper thin. Do you forgive me? Of course I forgive you. She snuggled against him, pressing her bottom and hips into his lap. And before she could fall asleep, she said, I'm so sorry, Barry. Thank you for closing the door. I love you so much. She wasn't sure if he replied because she dropped off into sleep herself, shivering beneath the thick blankets. When she woke, the bed was empty. Barry often rose and took the first shower of the day, so she wasn't surprised. And even on the days when he didn't want to shower, it was still his job to start the coffee pot. Yet this morning there was no running shower, no smell of roasting coffee, bitter yet inviting wafting up to their bedroom from the kitchen below. In fact, the house was colder, quieter than usual. She turned to the clock to find the unlit face, no power. Well, that explained the cold hanging portentous in the air. 
Their electric furnace had no doubt been out for hours. Wendy looked out the bedroom window and surveyed the neighborhood. Power lines, gutters, and tree branches were thick with icicles, which shined in the soft orange-pink light of early morning. Mrs. Hamilton across the street was pushing a snowblower at her age. The Thompson children were in the yard laughing and throwing snowballs at the cars that crept slowly past. No doubt Barry was out front digging their cars out of the snow. And Wendy made up her mind not to say anything about the coffee. Wrapped in her flannel robe for warmth, she crept downstairs calling out her husband's name. He didn't answer. Nor did she find him in the driveway cleaning off the cars, both cemented under a mound of crystalline white powder. He must be struggling with the snowblower, she thought, as she put the kettle on their gas stove. He's probably in the shed taking it apart and reassembling it like he has to do every winter. She would make instant coffee for them both. Using the pot of water on their gas stove, she imagined herself carrying the warm cup out to him. Imagine the big smile he'd give her when she handed it over with a kiss. She stood at the window, looking out over the snow and listening to the water burble in the pot. Her eyes fell on the closed shut door on its dark windows. And then she saw the mound of snow in front of the shed door, the fallen wire protruding like a black snake from the tree above the shed. It wasn't until she realized that the scrap of fabric flapping in the breeze was a gray bathrobe that she began to scream. <laughs> Once the emergency crew reached her house despite the trepid conditions, they examined Barry's body and determined the time of death was to be somewhere between 1 and 3 a.m. It would have been impossible to see the downed line in those blizzard conditions, they told her. But that can't be right, she insisted. I felt him crawl back into bed with me. He, he, he held me. He must have gotten up again. Perhaps he heard another noise, the officer said, his eyes full of sympathy and sadness. Wendy knew better. Her husband hadn't gotten out of bed. He had returned to her only once to find out if he had been forgiven. Thank <music> you.